start anytime. Just kind of get their attention. And All right, guys. I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. I appreciate it. Thank you. My name is uh, Will Rushton, and I'm one of the, I would say I'm one of the medical toxicologists, but I think currently I am the only medical toxicologist right now in the state of Alabama. Used to be two of us until this summer when my uh, partner left me. But right now I'm actually the medical director for the uh, state's poison center. And so it's actually a, a really fun opportunity I have with that because I get to talk to a lot of physicians and a lot of practitioners throughout the state. And I'm sure I've t spoken on the phone to several people here in this room. But I'm also an emergency physician. I run the uh, medical toxicology program as well as at uh, UAB. And so I started giving this talk actually about eight years ago. And it's actually a pretty fun talk to give in the sense that it's just sort of crazy what people out there are doing. When I initially started actually doing this talk is sort of, I created two versions. One was for medical professionals. And then another one was actually more for the lay public. And I went around actually to a couple of uh, high schools and talked to you know, high school counselors. I started talking to high school parents. And I realized you actually have to be a little bit careful about it because the, at least the way that we approach it, or I approach it, there's a certain amount of emotional distance to it. But um, I was actually trying to find these other articles from about a couple of years ago when I was in Winchester, Virginia giving this. I spoke to an auditorium of about 100 parents of high school seniors and they were so afraid that I was gonna tell high school students how to get high that they uh, carded everyone. You had to be 18 and older to get in. And it, you know, I really realized after that is sort of there was a lot of emotions that go along with this talk. And because the way that I sort of approach it, it's just in my mind sort of crazy what people do to get high, and particularly with these new synthetic compounds that are really flooding the market right now. I'll spend a lot of time talking about those. But I guess when you're a parent, um, is you're sort of really dealing with this, it's a, uh, a lot more personal. So I started to be a lot more careful about this talk and really gotten away from just giving this now to medical professionals as well. Because there are just so many different ways people get high. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. In the uh, bottom, I see some people nodding here, the brave souls that sit in the uh, front audience. You guys don't know that's where the pop quiz is coming in about 10 minutes. Uh, but you know, this is called farming, but farming with a P-H, P-H-A-R-M-I-N-G. With the idea that if you're adolescents, you can go raid your parents, your grandparents' uh, medical cabinets and dump all these medicines they have into a bowl, and then you pop, start popping random pills, having no idea what they are, and see what effects you have. I mean, it's just, again, crazy, or maybe just how courageous, or maybe just how stupid uh, people out there are doing. And it makes our jobs really tough, particularly when people do things like farming because you know their families or they come in and they want to know what they took and I'm asking them what did you take and they all think it's like CSI you know that we just pluck people's hair samples out and say oh obviously you got into some Norco or we need to be really careful because that was some blood pressure medication and then another thing out here is the uh, hand sanitizers and I'm not quite sure what sort of formulation you guys are using in our emergency department we recently got away from sort of the uh, gel-based formulation and now we use the foam-based formulation because you know this stuff is 98 percent ethanol and until a couple of years ago i have a course for medical students and emergency medicine residents and med internal medicine residents on toxicology and we used to actually show them how to take this and really make it into what we call prison juice which is really you make it into sort of pure ethanol and it's really not that difficult. You sort of take a lot of the gel formulation and put it in a coffee filter, put a little bit of salt in it, precipitate it out, and what comes through the coffee filter is a lot like lemon-tasted vodka. I got a little bit of trouble because I let people try it in the middle of the afternoon on their toxicology rotation. That was politely suggested to me that we should not do that anymore. So I have no financial disclosures, but not for a lack of trying. And I think really to understand drug abuse and particularly analytic testing for drug abuse, you really have to understand sort of our, more, our history, which really starts in 1981. And I really picked 1981 because this is really where we start focusing on how do we start screening people for drug abuse and how we start identifying what drugs people are using. And what happened is in May 81 is this prowler crashed on the deck of the USS Nimitz. 14 uh, crewmen were uh, killed, multiple other were severely injured. And they went back and did this ad hoc analysis afterwards. And gosh forbid, they found that multiple members of the deck 
particularly the flight crew, were actually testing positive for THC, for marijuana. And this is right when Reagan uh, was sort of ascending into his presidency. And this was a really big deal for him, and he really harped on this. And this is actually where we get the idea of a drug-free workplace, because it started with his 1986 executive order, where he mandated testing for all federal employees. And he actually got together with his uh, drug czar, which was uh, Dr. Turner at that time, and they worked together at uh, SAMHSA, and they really came up with the NIDA-5, NIDA being short for the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And the NIDA-5 is marijuana, cocaine, amphetamine salts, opiates, notice not opioids, opiates, and PCP. And this is what they started screening for in 1986 for all federal employees. And then after this, it sort of became the idea of the drug-free workplace, which uh, I'm sure many of y'all, if not all of y'all, have, like I have had to do, is go through sort of uh, drug screening before I started my employment. And what's still really interesting about this is this came around in 1986. And for those of you that are familiar with drug screens, as you'll notice, this looks very similar because it's still what's on standard urine drug screens that we're still testing for. I almost said in 2019, but I gotta get with the times and say now in uh, 2020. And the whole way that people are using drugs has changed because yes, absolutely, people are still going to their local drug dealer and they're still uh, buying cocaine, they're still buying heroin. We're still seeing, I'm sure you're seeing methamphetamines all the time, just like I am. But I think even just looking at the military's you know, experience now, going forward to 2014, is this is on the deck of the USS Carl Vinson, is they went back and they're still doing drug testing and the military has a lot better analytics than we are, but now the military's really trying to also deal with the synthetic drug use. And it's just really interesting to me that this is still a major problem that we have, but our drug testing is still focused on those 1986 sort of night of five, because in addition to people still using heroin, cocaine, occasionally uh, PCP. Now we're seeing things like bath salts and spice and K2, which we're gonna talk about. The military is really struggling with it and we're still struggling with it because the internet has been such a big game changer. You know, in addition to just going to your local drug dealer, now it's just overwhelming what you can get on the internet, you know, quickly, easily, and cheaply without really getting caught. And so we're gonna run through Quickly, a little bit of sympathomimetics. I think a lot of people are familiar with these, but the sympathomimetics, uh, particularly prescription drug ones, we're seeing sort of a persistent and wide outbreak, particularly among adolescents, college students, and graduate students. And they sort of span from Ritalin, which is methylphenidate, uh, to Adderall, which is dextroamphetamine. And the whole reason why Adderall is so popular, it's this dextro group on the amphetamine that's really specific for increasing dopamine levels inside your CNS tissue. One of the reasons why I think dopamine is just, uh, can be very addicting and give you such sort of pleasure stimuli. We created Lizdex amphetamine, which is Vyvanse, with the idea that, hey, we're gonna create a pro-drug to Adderall with the idea we're gonna just delay people's high in the hope that this is gonna be beneficial and cut down the abuse of Adderall, and unfortunately that has not really played out. You know, but if you're, a college kid, and college kids are reading the internet quite a bit, you know, particularly because they're sharing these substances with their roommates, with their friends, is if you Google this, you'll find out that, hey, it's way better to actually take your roommate's methylphenidate, the Ritalin, um, also goes by Concerta. And the reason for that is if you do get drug tested, methylphenidate does not have amphetamine backbone. So the standard urine drug screen, still using those NIDA-5 as a backbone of all urine drug screens are using, will not pick up Ritalin, methylphenidate, but will actually pick up sort of the Adderall, the dextroamphetamines, and the Vyvanse substances as well. And so if you ever talk to college kids, graduates, kids that are abusing, particularly their uh, friends or their roommates' substances, you'll find that they're you know, very cognizant about the fact that it's better to sort of evade uh, routine surveillance with Ritalin. And, you know, even when people are taking prescription drugs, they're not just orally ingesting it. People are crushing up, they're snorting it, um, you know, they're uh, injecting it. And the intoxication you really get from these, from these stimulants is sympathomimetic toxidrome. 
with really rapid speech, sort of like I'm talking now, large pupils, madriasis, a lot of diaphoresis, hypertension. And often you can pick these people out in the emergency department because there's 10 or 15 security officers around them trying to hold them down. But the benefits to it is really sort of the stimulation of the pleasure centers. And it's really a dopamine surge um, with the amphetamine compounds that people are getting. Sort of moving on to a, another form of prescription drug abuse I, I imagine everyone in this room is unfortunately very familiar with is sort of the whole opioid um, epidemic that we're having. I still like uh, this, this picture of House, Dr. House up here. I use it a lot now for, in my medical toxicology course. And I gotta tell you, it's pretty disheartening because a lot of people now no longer have any idea who Dr. House is. <laughs> but if you remember from the TV show, you know, he was highly addicted to Vicodin. And I think it's worthwhile just at least bringing up Vicodin because Vicodin got pulled from the market. And why did it get pulled from the market? It was acetaminophen and hydrocodone. And now we're using things like Norco, which is still acetaminophen and hydrocodone. But to me, it's really just an idea of just absolutely how addicting, you know, even these prescription drugs must be because Vicodin has 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, whereas Norco only has 325, so just over half. The reason they had to pull Vicodin and Lortab from the market is because these drugs are so addicting that people are going into acetaminophen, hepatocellular necrosis, um, getting liver injury, and then I was seeing them for a whole different reason. But we know from studies that, you know, acetaminophen is absolutely synergistic with hydrocodone. I think it's just really too bad that just because these drugs are so addicting, you know, we've now gone to a less efficacious um, pain medication regimen um, and ha fortunately had to pull Vicodin. You know, the other opioids come in a lot of varying kinetics. This is actually heroin up here. Heroin is not really some special drug. It's just morphine with two acetyl groups on it. So when we talk about heroin as is this sort of nebulous compound that's, you know, uh, grown in poppy fields, um, all it is is when people inject it, it crosses the blood-brain barrier um, extremely quickly. And all you're seeing as tissues actually just do is convert heroin into morphine. So you get very high morphine levels uh, inside your CNS tissue. And that's why when you look at the urine drug screens test for opiates, it's actually testing really for morphine metabolite because heroin will get metabolized to uh, morphine three glucuronide, which is what's being tested. On the flip side is methadone. So heroin's very quick acting, um, you know, lasts for maybe an hour, two hours, whereas unfortunately methadone can be a lot more dangerous because if someone ingests methadone, particularly if they overdose on it, you know, they may not show that opioid toxidrome, which is the CNS depression, respiratory depression, occasionally respiratory failure, leading to anoxic injury for 10 to 12 hours later. And so if someone ever overdoses on methadone or takes, you know, a super therapeutic dose of methadone, it's really frustrating because they're very resource intensive. You may have someone that's wide awake talking to you, but you know, they just ingested it five hours ago and they're easily at risk for still developing a uh, respiratory failure and need very close monitoring, usually for at least 12 hours. The uh, duragesic fentanyl patches are almost sort of a bane of our existence in the toxicology <coughs> world. You know, these are fentanyl patches. They're designed to wear for 72 hours, but you take them off after 72 hours really because of the dermal irritation that goes along with them. I don't know if anyone here is actually familiar with this idea called dumpster diving. It's looking at my front row again, but I don't see any nods this time. Yeah. No. So I don't think anything really is just illustrates how absolutely addicting these drugs must be. Then when people dumpster dive, which means they go to bins of medical waste uh, behind hospice centers, behind nursing homes. And they're looking for these used uh, fentanyl patches with the idea that they know there's still fentanyl in them. But if you get a used fentanyl patch, you know, they're supposed to be dermally absorbed. So the best way to get high on them is sort of buccal absorption. So people put them underneath their tongue and then they suck on them trying to get out the fentanyl from it, which is really dangerous because if you're overdosing on a bunch of Percocet, um, you know, even uh, Vicodin, Norco, Lortabs, Hopefully, if you take enough or you take too much of it, you're going to pass out and you're not going to take any more. The problem with these fentanyl patches is when people have the sort of sublingual absorption ongoing from it, uh, they get too much in their system and then they pass out and they aspirate these patches. This is actually a big enough problem that 
uh, my professional society, the American College of Medical Toxicology, we've been lobbying the makers of these dur duragesic patches to put a metal strip just on the side, that way hoping they'll actually be radio opaque on abdominal plane film so we can actually see if someone's ingested them because right now they're completely radiolucent. And we suspect them often you know, based by history um, or by friends and family. But you know, I've, I've done sort of a lot of crazy things or trying to get medical students to you know, do a lot of crazy things with me such as try prison juice. But I keep trying to tell them we really need to make like a YouTube PSA with it, which is where you take a hole puncher and cut a hole here in the corner, take a string, you know, tie it to the hole and tie the other end of the string to your finger. That way when you pass out, hopefully you'll rip out the patch with it. <laughs> and you know, I, I am trying to be a little bit funny with it, really just try to illustrate just how dangerous these patches um, out there. And they're just very hard to treat, um, really needs high dose of uh, naloxone. Um, or very often actually needs uh, intubation, mechanical ventilation until they can pass these patches. And then, you know, talking about other ways that people are overdosing or abusing narcotics, I don't know if anyone's familiar with what this is in the bottom left corner. Purple drink. Well, I don't know if I heard purple drink or if I heard purple drink. <laughs> but to really have credibility with your patients, you need to call it the correct way, which is purple drink. Um, it also goes by Cesarep. I've also recently heard lean. This actually originated in the 90s, mid 90s, and actually in the Houston uh, sort of hip hop culture. And uh, even Lil Wayne has actually been hospitalized uh, with this for uh, several times in the past couple of years. This still seems to be very popular um, in drug abuse sort of vernacular. You know, just about all of the uh, college students, medical students, a lot of the residents are at least familiar with this term, purple drink, that's out there. And what is purple drink? Well, still in several states, you can get uh, codeine, promethazine, cough syrup. So you take that, you mix it with Sprite, and get the purple flavor. Um, you actually add a purple Jolly Rancher for it, and people ingest it. Um, and you know, the codeine gets metabolized to morphine and gives you sort of a uh, baseline morphine type of high. Again, still very common, um, and something that people are frequently using. So when we talk about opioids, you know, we're used to thinking about prescription drugs. People ingest them, although they will very frequently inject them. But there are different ways to use it. Is This down here is actually called smoking the dragon. And it's the idea that you can actually freebase heroin a little bit if you put it on a piece of limium foil and then superheat it. And it's called smoking the dragon because apparently as you're sort of inhaling the heroin, it's the smoke that comes up. It's supposed, you're supposed to hallucinate a little bit and it looks like a dragon. But you know, toxicology is so fascinating because when people do this, you know, not only are we worried about the heroin they're ingesting, but people are absolutely uh, ingesting aluminum as well. And aluminum toxic <laughs> Toxicity gives you something called spongiform leukoencephalopathy, you know, big holes in your brain, and also it's been associated with early onset Alzheimer's. And, you know, we see this over and over again with drugs of abuse. You know, even when people are using cocaine or street drugs, it's not just the drug that they think that they're ingesting. It's, you know, there's a lot of fake drugs that are out there. We'll talk about the bath salts. A lot of times people buying bath salts are actually buying methamphetamine. But it's also drug dealers, it turns out, are not the most honest people either. Um, about five to seven years ago, there was a big outbreak of levamisole in cocaine products. Levamisole is actually an anti helminth agent used really in veterinary products. Unfortunately, it caused a lot of agranulocytosis. And it was really unclear about why so much levamisole was being put in cocaine. But the DEA estimated that about one in four habitual cocaine users had been exposed to levamisole. And we're seeing sort of a rash of people come in with agranulocytosis and these pretty sort of pathognomonic rashes um, that they were getting. So, so actually just what makes treating these drug abuses even more difficult. Not only do we not know what they think they got, we're still trying to think, you know, what else is put in there as well. And so, again, the opioid toxidrome, why is opioid toxidrome so dangerous? You know, it's CNS depression, respiratory depression, and it's really the anoxic brain injury that uh, gets you with opioid toxidrome. Just very quickly going to touch on uh, benzazepines only because I love this poster so much. In a world where certainties are few, there's Ativan. And no, it's not a real poster. Um, 
you know, yes, I know this was some fake news right here, but, you know, I just get so much joy every time I see this. You know, uh, the benzos really fall into this toxidrome called the sedative hypnotic toxidrome. Sedative hypnotics, you know, benzos, a lot of the atypical antipsychotics are out there, can cause some CNS depression. Thankfully, you know, by themselves, is they tend not to cause severe respiratory depression enough to go to anoxic injury. The difficulty is they're absolutely synergistic with other drugs. So if you ingest, uh, you know, benzos and ethanol, very dangerous, and absolutely very dangerous if you're ingesting benzos with opioids as well. Excuse me a second. <coughs> and let's move on a little bit to some newer products out there, the synthetic cannabinoids. So are commonly called in our vernacular SPICE or K2. You know, these really hit the market in uh, about 2008, 2009, when I think we had the first wave of the epidemic, then they went away, and they've now sort of had another resurgence. And I don't know if anything causes as much confusion as what the heck are these drugs that are out there. I don't know if we have any Clemson graduates in the audience, but it's interesting that these are the original compounds, and in fact, uh, Spice is the first one to come out here, and I believe it's JWH73. And notice most of these compounds on the screen start with JWH17. And this is sort of where the Clemson connection comes in. It's JWH stands for John W. Huffman. And in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, he's really trying to create a non-opioid analgesic. And so he studied, he's a chemist, and he studied all these products, did extensive research on them, ultimately abandoned these products because uh, caused a lot of addiction, a lot of hallucinations, a lot of uh, psychosis <coughs> that goes along with it. But when he was developing these products, initially he thought he was going to be selling them, so he published all of his data and patent with the U.S. Patent Office. And all of his research is completely publicly available, complete with recipes about how to make it. But you know right now, if you're a drug manufacturer, number one is it's probably not the ideal drug to sell to a general population, but number two is also protected by U.S. patent law. Well, you know, in the 2000s, as drug makers decided that, hey, we're not bound to U.S. patent law. You know, we're already engaged in illicit activity. There is a wealth of information out here. All we have to do is just go read his publicly available data, and we're just not going to ignore the fact that this is covered by U.S. patent law. And that's actually where these compounds initially came from. That's why we call them by his initial initials, is the way he actually filed them with the U.S. Patent Office. And so every time, so Spice came on first, then it took a while for DEA, states caught up, um, and then they just waited. You know, this became a Schedule I drug, so then K2 came on the market. And so now when we're talking about sort of the Spice products or the K2 products, Really, we're referring to them as an umbrella term, and we really should not be calling it spice, but I sort of understand that's just sort of the common sort of umbrella vernacular term that's being used for it. But really, it should be called synthetic cannabinoids. And we really don't understand these substances at all. Um, but they're a synthetic compound, and if you open up these packets right here, you see they actually come out as leaves. Well, this is to give people the mistaken idea that this is an alternative to marijuana, or it's similar to marijuana. It's not similar at all. This is basically just dried leaves they sprayed a synthetic compound onto. You know, there's nothing natural about these products. Um, they're completely made in a laboratory. Um, but really, uh, it's designed to give people the idea that they're using something akin to marijuana, although I think more and more recently we're figuring out, or people are figuring out they can inject it as well. And we're still really struggling to understand these compounds because when we talk about the synthetic cannabinoids, it's not like we're just talking now about, you know, one, two, or even ten compounds. There's probably about a thousand different compounds that have been identified that fall underneath sort of uh, this umbrella phrase. And they're still called the synthetic cannabinoids because the only uni unifying thing we can really figure out about them is they all have activity at the CB receptors, the cannabinoid receptors. But they clearly do not give you a sort of marijuana type of high. We see a lot more sympathomimetic, a lot more agitation with people. There have been multiple reports published in the literature of people developing acute ischemic strokes, acute hemorrhagic strokes, cardiac arrest, um, cardiac dysfunction um, from these. And one of the most common things I see is people coming with agitation and very frequently seizures um, after abusing these substances. <coughs> And uh, I still have Cheech and Chong in here. Most of I think they would be sort of disappointed what people are using now. 
And, it, and there's, we really need a lot of research into this, and people have been trying to figure out, but you know, there's probably a dopamine component, which is why they're so addicting and why people like it. And, but the, I think the spectrum that people actually present is extremely diverse. <coughs> and a lot of times I see people come in after these compounds will be very agitated. Often they'll come in with a lot of CNS depression. And the other problem is too, is we have no idea about the kinetics of this. Some people tend to metabolize this off very quickly. And other people, you know, they often require uh, admission or overnight observation just because they're so altered or so encephalopathic um, until this drug can finally get out of their system. And particularly, mon they need monitoring for uh, breakthrough seizures and sort of cardiac dysrhythmias. Another synthetic compound, which is the only thing I know that I think causes more confusion than the spice or synthetic cannabinoids, is bath salts. Because what the heck is this whole bath salt craze that's out there? Um, these compounds actually follow the synthetic cannabinoids by about two to three years, and we're still seeing them in very widespread use. And when basalt sort of fart first started making the news, is again, uh, I got this call from this mother because she had found her daughter in the bathroom with the door locked, and she had bed, bath, and beyond basalts around her. And her mother thought, oh my gosh, she's abusing basalts. <laughs> the basalts I'm talking about here have no relation to actually real bath salts. In fact, the drug bath salts, which are really synthetic cath cathinone, excuse me, we'll talk about those. If you put those in bath with you, you just wasted a whole bunch of money because there is nothing related to bath salts to the synthetic cathinones. It was just a way for the drug makers to market this product as not for human consumption, when the only reason that they actually exist is for human consumption. And so they were being sold in uh, a lot of drug stores. In fact, these products up here at the top I actually went to a, the local college store in Charlottesville, Virginia, and bought these. And I used to actually pass around the unopened compounds to show people you know, how easy they are to get. I mean, it really just took me leaving my office and walking across the street. And then and now again that they made Schedule 1, I decided not to transport them across state lines down to Alabama. <laughs> I got a lot of good advice doing toxicology, as you can see. And so, we've given this talk a bunch, and a lot of feedback I get is, hey, start taking out the chemical structures. We don't care about chemical structures. And it sort of grates my soul as a toxicologist, and so I've done everything I can to limit as much chemical structures. But we're going to come back to methadone and MDPV, because these were two of the three original synthetic cathinones that hit the market. And so, the signs and symptoms that you get from the synthetic cathinones mimic a lot, actually, the pathometric toxidrome, agitation, tachycardia, medriasis. Um, again, um, intracranial hemorrhage and also ischemic hemorrhages have been associated with it. What's really interesting is this paranoia that people get. Uh, the psychosis, it tends to last way beyond the, after the other drug effects have worn off. And there's still a lot of debate whether the synthetic cathinones, which is where the bath salts are, you know, cause primary psychosis, or really if they abet in unmasking underlying psychiatric disease. See down here, this is actually a picture of methadone. So this is one of the original synthetic cathinones being sold in the United Kingdom. And uh, here it's actually being sold as plant food. Again, do not give this to your plant. Um, this is completely designed for human consumption, but just another way that, you know, people are trying to get around existing drug laws saying, hey, we don't mean for people to ingest this when that's absolutely what they're made for. And where does it come from? Well, you know, Alabama actually, sort of an indirect route, plays a role in this. Because these three pictures right here are all related by cot. And so this is actually what cot, it grows in Eastern Africa. For uh, those of you guys that are friends of Black Hawk Down, if you watch that movie, you'll see they're actually smoking it throughout the movie. And this is actually the, uh, one of the real life photos from when the USS Alabama was actually uh, taken over by Somali pirates. And so what happened is the USS Alabama was taken over by Somali pirates. They took Captain Phillips as hostage, put him in the back of one of the rescue boats. Then they got picked up by a US Navy destroyer here in Toad. If you're familiar at all with this story, is then uh, three Navy SEALs under the orders of uh, Obama actually took three simultaneous shots on the open seas and apparently made three of the most amazing shots in the history, I guess, of Navy SEAL warfare, which is clearly not my expertise. 
But you know, why did they take down these three Somali pirates? Well, they were in negotiations with them, and they actually uh, were observing the Somali pirates were heavily using cot, and they thought they were becoming more erratic. And so they finally made the decision to take them out and attempt to save uh, Captain Phillips. And cot is actually where we get synthetic cathodones, because it was really our experience, the, our military experience in the Middle East, and but in particular East Africa, where our military personnel started abusing cot as well. And then drug makers, really the Middle East, figured out, hey, you know, instead of the plant-based form, we can actually synthesize this. And so what cot is, it's actually very similar to amphetamines. And so when we talk about bath salts, synthetic cathinones, the backbone is actually a naturally based product. So in some ways, these are more semi-synthetic uh, drugs of use that people are using now. I know, I, I tried to take out the chemical structures, but I failed. But just bear with me here for a second, because I like this slide. To me, it really shows just how interrelated all these drugs are. You know, if we start up here, this is actually um, MDMA. So this is methylene dioxymethamphetamine, um, colloquially known as ecstasy or molly. It's out here. And then down here, you see methamphetamine. And I mentioned that methadrone and methylone and MDPV were the three original bath salts or synthetic cathinones that are out there. And just look how structurally similar. Uh, methadrone is actually the exact same as methamphetamine, just with this extra beta ketone group here. And the beta ketone group here is just this oxygen. This is actually the beta position of this uh, amphetamine back salt. And you see that uh, methylone is incredibly similar to MDMA, which is ecstasy. And that's why when we talk about bath salts, you know, we talk about them in a way that they're mysterious and they're confusing and what the heck does bath salts have to do with anything with people getting high? Well, it's really just another way for people to abuse amphetamines. And there's a lot of research right now what you know, is going on chemically or biochemically by adding this extra oxygen group. And again, the short answer is we still just do not fully understand this. Um, there's a thought that it might localize uh, dopamine more as some of the neurotransmitters and increase that dopamine surge. Uh, but to be frank, that's really just the best guess right now. What we do know is sort of the high from the bath salts tends to be, um, you know, a lot more quicker in onset. And a lot of sympathomimetic findings you get from them, like that extreme hypertension, tachycardia, the association with uh, intracranial hemorrhages um, can be a little bit more profound as well. Oh, this is just, this is um, actually, uh, Mescaline, which is what's in peyote, is also very similar to what people are abusing. I know I'm getting short on time here, but I'm going to wrap up really talking about sort of the MDMA subculture that's out there. The MDMA subculture is actually really fascinating. It's really grown up, again, in huge violation, now this time of not of U.S. patent laws, but in violation of copyright laws. Because different makers of MDMA, again, methylene dioxide, methamphetamine, um, imprint different sort of copyright infringements. Uh, here's the Playboy Bunny, because it's a little bit unfortunate that's the first one I jumped to, but I think VW's over here, and uh, McDonald's is on here as well. I think, oh, here's Calvin Klein. The idea is like, hey, you know, I really like that Calvin Klein high, so I want to go ask my drug dealer for that, because it's supposed to represent uh, the maker of it. And the MDMA subculture is, I know I keep saying this, but it's just really fascinating and it's also really brave against, or stupid what people are, are doing. And I don't know if anyone is familiar with the opening of another great talks movie, which is Bad Boys 2. And so in the opening of that movie, you know, they're at a club, they're in the rave, and what you do is uh, they're ingesting ecstasy, because the whole point about that movie is sort of trying to stop this uh, ecstasy imports coming in. And this guy gets incredibly diaphoretic, um, he starts shaking, they drag him out to the alleyway in the rain, he's profoundly diaphoretic, he's seizing, sweat is just pouring off of him, he starts shaking, and you could almost even visualize his cardiac arrest that's going on with him, and they leave him dead in the alleyway. And that is probably really the most severe form that we see or what we really worry about the most, I think, with people acutely ingesting MDMA. Because an accidental byproduct of MDMA is this thing called paramethoxymethamphetamine. I promise I will not show you this chemical structure. But what it can do is it uncouples your mitochondria in a very similar way that aspirin toxicity can. So it actually prevents your body from making ATP, the main energy molecule. Um, but the electron transport chain of the mitochondria is still running. 
So that energy has to get released somehow, so it gets released as entropy, as heat. And that's why people just become uh, profoundly hyperthermic. But then they quickly lose their ATP stores. Um, the brain starts seizing just because the brain is so reliant on constant energy metabolism and then very quickly go into cardiac arrest. But you know, MDMA has two different names out there. You know, there's ecstasy and then there's also molly. And so where did molly come from? Why do people call it molly? It got made very popular by Madonna and uh, Hannah Montana. I guess if she's using drugs, we're supposed to call her Miley Cyrus now, so we protect Disney's uh, infringement. But molly's supposed to be short for molecule, being that it's supposed to be just one molecule when you buy this product, that one molecule is supposed to be MDMA. Because the problem, I mean, obviously there's lots of problems, but a big problem for habitual drug users of MDMA is they really don't know what they're getting. And this is sort of very widespread in the MDMA culture, just because, again, drug makers are not that honest. And so there's this whole internet community out there. This is actually Dance Safe. Dance Safe is actually run by two uh, PhD chemists. Their names are Earth and Fire. One's in Earth, one's Fire. These are actually real people. I've communicated with them. Um, they are incredibly well educated, but they are huge proponents of the safe MDMA market, particularly at dance raves. And so what they've done is they fund this Dance Safe, and Dance Safe actually sells home testing kits that you can uh, buy yourself and have these different reagents. You can try to see just how much MDMA is. And these kits are actually pretty good, but they're not great. So now they've actually created uh, ecstasydata.org. And this is such a great way to lose an afternoon and get nothing productive done. <laughs> just go to this website. Because for $40, you can quality check your drug dealer. What it does is you just take, you know, you buy 100 pills, you send one of those pills in for $40, Earth and Fire will run this through GC mass spec, which is the gold standard. I uh, you know, see people all the time and want to run their products. I cannot get anything run for $40. I mean, GC mass spec, again, is sort of the gold standard that's out there. And what they do is they make all of their data publicly available. So every time you actually send in a pill, they'll run it through GC mass spec, and they'll actually tell you what's in there, and then they put it on their website. And they've been doing this about 15 years. So you can actually see trends of different incipients, you know, accidental products or other products um, over the last 15 years. You can break it down by country. You can dig it about region. You could uh, break it down by state. And you can break it down by city. And yes, Birmingham, Alabama is on xcdata.org. And it looks like this is a little bit hard to see, but this is sort of um, just a random screenshot from the day that I picked in here. This person right here, I don't think it's coming out that well, but they brought something called green PCP. And they got completely gypped because the number one product in this was TMFP, which is sort of a generic stimulant out there. It gives you a little bit of a high, but not nearly what you're looking for if you're trying to get MDMA. Um, but the second substance in there is actually Benadryl, it's diphenhydramine. So this is not a drug dealer I would trust in the future. Whereas this person up here that bought uh, micro powder, um, you know, their drug dealer is fairly honest. It's actually pure MDMA that's on there. But it's really just to give you an idea of what is the ecstasy sort of subculture that's out there. And the reason I've actually communicated with uh, Earth and Fire before is we actually took their data. This is the best publicly available data of byproducts being sold as ecstasy. And we actually published it and showed there was sort of a regional uh, breakdown. Your different regions had different spikes. It was actually really fascinating working with them. And then again, very unreliable in form. You know, why do people like MDMA? It's actually a methamphetamine backbone, but it has this extra ring structure on it that's very specific for this one serotonin receptor. And I know when I talk about serotonin receptor and subtypes, people get really excited because that's why we all went into healthcare. But it's really this 5-HT2A receptor. And the 5-HT2A receptor is interesting because LSD, magic mushrooms, dimethyltryptines, if you're gonna do toad lifting for those of you guys in the front of the audience, you know, these are all agonists at that 5-HT2A receptor, and absolutely the same thing with MDMA, so why people like it. They get a methamphetamine dopamine type of high, but then they get this really serotonin agonism at 5-HT2A, and it's really what gives you sort of this color um, energy around you. People that are abusing this talk about they can taste color, they can smell color that goes along with it. And, uh, you know, bruxism is actually a big problem with it. People tend to grind their teeth and people can sort of get a lot of uh, oral decay. 
And uh, so they sell binkies here, and some binkies are really adult pacifiers. You put them in your mouth when you're abusing MDMAs at raves, and they light up around you. So they have, you can't really see it, but there's sort of a light chain going up around to really sort of increase the experience. And part of the idea is too is like maybe it can cut down a lot of the bruxism. What concerns me about this is, uh, say for ages 12 and up, and I'm really worried about what 12 year olds out there um, buying these compounds. Let's see, I'm getting sort of, and then another big thing too, I mentioned sort of the uncoupling of mitochondria. If you are seeing someone that's using MDMA and they're acting you know, more agitated and more encephalopathic than you think that they should be, it's one thing I would actually focus on is looking at their sodium. There's a very high prevalence of SIDH and hyponatremia associated with uh, bruxism. I'm just gonna end here on this last slide. Just dextromethorphan. You know, this is of still of the legal over-the-counter ways to get high is dextromethorphan. You know, we prescribe it out there or just prescribe, people can just go out there and get it as an anti tussive agent. It actually has weak mu opioid effects. But unfortunately, as you start ingesting more of it, it actually has some SSRI effects that go along with it. And if you ingest a whole bottle, so of Robotessum DM, you know, colloquially known as robo-chugging, if you're in the know. It's very big among adolescent males. They ingest a whole bottle of robitussin. has anti-NMDA effects. And anti-NMDA is actually specific to dextromethorphan, but also to ketamine and to PCP. And so it really gives you this disassociative uh, analgesia. So people that uh, abuse it, they sort of describe themselves as their body is, or their spirit is flowing down above their body and they're looking down on it. It's very similar to those of y'all who uh, use ketamine and that same sort of uh, delirium agitation that people get when they're using ketamine. The problem is, is when, you know, to get that anti-NMDA effects, you also get profoundly serotonergic. Um, so, you know, particularly adolescents and people in their 20s that are actually heavily abusing this is that they're also on an SSRI uh, for any reasons. They can come in with profound uh, serotonin syndrome. And I've seen it, we've actually had to put several people in ICUs and um, intubate them just for control of the refractory seizures. And I think I'm out of time, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and right there. Thank you for having me. Sure, the question was, you know, where is actually the origin of these drugs? Is it probably coming from Southeast Asia and the Middle East is where we think. The uh, DEA spent a lot of time really trying to pinpoint it down. And they've done some fascinating epidemiological work, particularly with the synthetic cathinones, the bath salts. And the synthetic cathinones first start popping up in centers that have major military uh, presence, sort of like San Diego uh, and Norfolk, and sort of spread internally. So we think the synthetic cathinones are really coming from Middle East suppliers, um, and then really sort of following, at least initially to get into the country before they became widespread, a sort of uh, military basis where the synthetic cannabinoids, which is the spice compounds, is probably coming from Southeast Asia, but at this point it's probably diverse itself into the Middle East as well. Yes, sir. Would the uh, pattern of taking normally marketed products and modify them to abuse them in a different way than what they were indicated, uh, are there any products out there other than what you've covered that, that are pretty much on the radar for being Sure. So the question is with the over-the-counter products, you know, what are we worried about, you know, to paraphrase it, that um, sort of on a radar that people could sort of synthetically alter. And, uh, you know, I think everyone's, I think, familiar with pseudoephedrine. Now we have to go get it behind the counter. I personally can only survive my life when I get a viral operatory respiratory infection, sort of the man flu on pseudoephedrine. So fortunately, I still went that one around. But the other compounds, you know, dextromethorphan, you can sort of metabolize um, or sort of synthetically alter. And for right now, at least I said, you mentioned CBD oil. Is that someone that we're really worried about? I don't think anyone really understands sort of the long-term health effects of CBD oil or where that's going to go with really its widespread use. I think it's highly debated and it's highly debated right now just because we don't have the slightest clue, but it's going to be really interesting in the next, you know, five to 10 years what happens with as CBD oil becomes more widespread, and certainly as uh, marijuana becomes more and more legalized, that's what that will mean from a really public health standpoint. So antidiarrheals yes. are behind the counter now too? Are you seeing a lot of? Yes, yeah, so the question is about, are we seeing a lot of abuse with antidiarrheals? And 
I'm guessing what you're really asking is low paramount toxicity. I mean, I don't even have, I would need a couple of hours really just to go on my rant about how dangerous uh, loperamide toxicity is. You know, loperamide is actually, it's an uh, opioid. And the idea behind it is, yeah, it's great for diarrhea because it causes constipation, just like as we all know opioids do, with the thought that, hey, we don't actually absorb uh, loperamide because you have this thing in your GI tract called the uh, P glycoprotein that any loperamide that comes in and gets spit back out. Unfortunately, you know, in about two or three years ago, as people on the internet figure out, hey, if you take a whole box of loperamide, you can actually overwhelm your P-glycoprotein, absolutely ingest it, and get an opioid type of high. It is so dangerous because it's causing this severe cardiomyopathy that we just don't have the slightest idea how to treat it. Um, people really coming in with just sort of gross uh, left ventricular dysfunction, um, uh, a lot of systolic dysfunction. But you're absolutely right, loperamide toxicity is something that we're not worried about people altering because right now they're just using it in its base form just to get high off of it. And it may soon be, need to be uh, you know, behind the pharmacist's desk as well. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, do we know any studies about if these actually uh, cross the placenta membrane? And unfortunately, no. I mean, it's obviously it's very, you can't really test these drugs on uh, human volunteers. And as far as I know, there have not been any uh, sort of animal studies, at least to my knowledge, about you know, if they're crossing uh, placenta. That being said is, unfortunately, we do have you know, experience with uh, pregnant women using these drugs quite a bit. In particular, I think a lot of the synthetic cannabinoids are out there. Um, and then I've talked to some of our OB colleagues, and they do fear a lot about sort of placenta abruption with it. But as to uh, withdrawal patterns, you know, f uh, you know after the uh, child is born, that I don't know anything about. Yes, sir. Sure, the question is about uh, Kratom and is that something that we see and that's really on our radar? And absolutely, Kratom is a nationally produced product. It's really, it's grown, at least indigenous, to Bali and to Malaysia. It has some weak uh, opioid effects, which is why people like it. It gives you sort of weak opioid type of high. There probably is some serotonergic activity as well. It's incredibly easy to get on the internet. Now, through the poison center is we don't get Kratom doesn't show up as much in our database because patients tend not to uh, have a severe enough toxidrome to require sort of emergent hospitalization or emergent evaluation that goes along with it. What we do see a lot is Kratom is when they mix it with other substances, uh, particularly opioids, um, some serotonergic products as well, or they're involved in a trauma and then they come in and they say that they've been using Kratom. I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, Google Trends or if you just Google the phrase Google Trends and you can actually uh, type in different keywords and we'll show you, you know, what states uh, are very popular in Googling these. And Kratom actually, if you look at Google Trends, it's interesting just looking at this yesterday as well because we're seeing a surge of that, I think, and also another product, if anyone's heard about it, uh, Tianaptapine or Red Dawn or Tiana as well. People tend to be using them in conjunction. Um, it's just really interesting that Google even says that people in Alabama are Googling Kratom a lot more. Kratom it's also interesting if you go on the internet and you want to Google, you know, prolong my kratom high, well, it's metabolized by your CYP system and it's metabolized pretty quickly. But it's very well known on the uh, internet that if you take a CYP inhibitor, such as tagamate, which is cimetidine, and we stopped using it because it has so much CYP interactions, but uh, CVS and Walgreens are still selling it, uh, it tagamate will really prolong your uh, kratom high. So, I've asked adolescents, every time I see them, I look at their medication list, and I'm trying to figure out why a 16-year-old would have cimetidine or tagamet on their medication list. And at this point, I now ask people, you know, are you using Kratom? Just because it's so widespread on the internet. And you're asking about 100 different adolescents. I think I've found two or three that have actually fessed up and saying that, yeah, they heard about it, and that's why they mentioned it on their medication list. 
Yes, sir. The question is, you know, how specific is Narcan? Narcan is uh, incredibly specific for the uh, mu opioid uh, receptors. You know, I sort of stayed away from Narcan a little bit in this talk because it's an antidote when used correctly is incredibly life-saving, very beneficial. You know, there's a lot of controversy associated with it now, particularly as we're handing out intranasal Narcan in the community. Um, but one of the reasons that in the hospital setting, even I think we're seeing a lot of problems with Narcan is it sort of just gets thrown often ubiquitously. You know, there's a altered person or there's sort of a nonspecific overdose. And if you give Narcan because it's so specific, say someone overdose is actually on benzos and antipsychotics, but they're also taking Percocet regularly, you know, you're gonna throw them immediately into the opioid toxidrome because it's so specific. Opioid toxidrome, you know, has a lot of GI effects, a lot of nausea and vomiting, so it's still not protecting the airway, now they're aspirating. Um, and because it's so specific is, you know, if it's not used really for that specific opioid toxidrome, is we've seen sort of a lot of aspiration complications from it. I don't know if that answers your question at all. Well, it is a wide spectrum for all the opioids or something. Yes, sir. The, the question is, is it, is it uh, beneficial for all the opioids? And yes, all the opioids that have activity, that mute opioid receptor, which is all the opioids that we're all familiar with, um, naloxone is very specific about reversing. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in the news really two years ago about these carfentyl, sufentyl preparations, um, just because those are bonding even tighter than naloxone does, those mu opioid receptors, just the high dose of naloxone that's needed to reverse those compounds. Um, but in general, our standard dosing of naloxone is sufficient uh, to treat sort of all opioid intoxications. All right, thank you.